I'm Lisa Coleman, and I use she and her pronouns. Welcome. Uh, before I begin, I would like to honor and acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose lands we now occupy. We acknowledge that we are gathered here in this both physical and virtual space, but many of our institutions and homes are located on the unceded lands of indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that the United States was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, as well as the discounted labor and intellectual innovations of many indigenous and other marginalized peoples. We continue to both recognize and dismantle these systemic exclusions and systems of oppression. We honor all those who've come before us, our ancestors, who paved the way for us to be here doing this important work, and the many contributions of people uh, who have no, are no longer with us. Let us take a moment of silence, five seconds, to and recognition and honor. Thank you. Uh, so this portion is my special shout out and thank you. So I wanna thank uh, Professor Jewel Jackson McCabe who's been leading the Black Women's Lead Initiative. I wanna thank you for your leadership, Jewel. Sorry you can't be here with us today, but thank you to Professor Rachel Swarns and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. Thank you for being our sponsors, uh, co-sponsors today. And of course to the Chair of Journalism, to Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver, to Assistant Dean Jenny McPhee and the Steering Committee of the NYU Women's Leadership Forum, to April Thompson and Tamara Santiago and Jenny Curry of the Women of Color Leadership Network. And thank you to all of our partners who collaborate with us to realize gender equity here at NYU and beyond. I would also like to give a special shout out to Mariette Westerman, Vice Chancellor in Abu Dhabi, and uh, for leading the conversation earlier today uh, with Beverly Tatum, the interim president of Mount Holyoke College and the former president of Spelman College. Uh, also to Fatia Toure for helping to organize that. And you know, we try to organize things across the globe, so uh, Congratulations to us for being able to actually do it. Um, I always want to thank my team in OGI and everyone working behind the scenes to make this possible. Thank you to Tony, Patricia, and Nick for the live stream possible. And thank you to Amanda and Joanna for making our gathering here quite beautiful and to the people who arranged the receptions. As you know, we are here to celebrate International Women's Day. And I'm very excited. We're gonna uh, talk a little bit in just a moment about our featured speaker. This program is our NYU, part of our NYU Women Lead series. Our NYU Lead is a global leadership accelerator and incubator that celebrates and amplifies the prolific work of women trailblazers globally, past and present. We center intersectional gender equity and innovative leadership. I wanna thank our current president, Andrew Hamilton, and Provost Gigi DePico for their tremendous support of NYU Women Lead, and we are thrilled to celebrate our newly designated first woman president of NYU, Linda Mills. Yes, we can clap for that. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Susan Goldberg. To say that I'm thrilled that Susan accepted the invitation to come and speak with us and have this sort of fireside chat today is an understatement. I, um, Susan has been just doing an am amazing work uh, throughout her career, and we are very privileged to have her join us here today. So let me read in her, her official bio, bio. Susan Goldberg is the president and C CEO of GBH, America's preeminent public media organization the largest producer of PBS content for television and web, and a major supplier of content for NPR and digital audio services. She is the first woman to serve in this role since GBH was founded in 1951. A nationally recognized journalist and leader, Goldberg has transformed media organizations, taking brands from reverence to relevance by diversifying staff, expanding coverage, and executing multi-platform transformations. Goldberg was named Editor-in-Chief of National Geographic in 2014 and Editorial Director of National Geographic Partners in 2015. As Editorial Director, she led all journalism across platforms, including digital journalism, magazines, podcasts, maps, newsletters, and social media, just a few things. Under her leadership, National Geographic was honored with 11 National Magazine Awards, including four awards in 2020 and the top prize for general excellence in 2019. 
In addition, National Geographic was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news photography in 2021, feature photography in 2019, and for explanatory reporting in 2017. Goldberg has led reporting that was honored with multiple local and state national awards, including the Pulitzer Prize at the San Jose Mer Mercury News, the, and four finalists for the Pulitzer Prize at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which I always smile, we have a Cleveland connection. She left National Geographic in early 2020, uh, and excuse me, she um, is also for, uh, served as a vice dean and professor of practice at Arizona State University. We love these educational connections with a joint appointment to the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the Global uh, College of Global Futures. She has been the executive editor for federal, state, and local government coverage for Bloomberg News in Washington, and that was from 2010 to 2014. And as I mentioned, she was working with the Cleveland Plain Dealer from 2007 to 2010. She has also worked, as I just mentioned, with the San Jose Mercury News and served as the paper's managing editor from 1999 to 2003. She's also worked for USA Today and also including stints as deputy magazine editor of News Life and Enterprise sections. She's also worked as the reporter and editor at the Detroit Free Press. And she began her career as a reporter in Seattle at the Seattle Post Intelligencer. She's a Michigan native. She, her bachelor's degree is, from journal, is in journalism from Michigan State University, where she now funds the Susan Goldberg Scholarship at the University's College of Communication Arts and Sciences for uh, Journalism. Let me just say, including for all her awards, she has been recognized repeatedly for leadership. She is one of our nation's greatest leaders. In 2013, 17, and 21, she was voted one of the Washington's most powerful women by Washingtonian Magazine. In 2015, she received the Exceptional Woman in Publishing Award from Women in Publishing. In 2020, In Style Magazine included her in the Badass 50 list and named her number seven. I think you were closer to number one. And in its issue, uh, talked about women who are changing the world, and indeed, Susan is changing the world. She was selected as one of Folio's top women in media for having an ex exceptional impact, and she's also been recognized by the International Women's Media Foundation and Leadership Honoree for her work in uplifting other journalists and stories that are underreported. She is a six-time juror for the Steen Pulitzer Prize, a member of the Reporters Committee for the Freedom Press, and president of the Board of the National Women in the Arts. She now lives in Boston, which we've got some fun catching up about. And, um, and so it is an honor to be with you here today. Please join me and let's give her our first round of applause. Yes. Um, well, will you have a seat first and then I'm good, because I have something I have to do just for a minute. So Susan, as I said, it's an honor and pleasure to be with you here today. And this is International Women's Day, and we are celebrating this by honoring you. So in honor, I'd like to present you with the NYU Trailblazer Award for Leadership and Leadership Excellence. Thank you for reimagining our present, our future, and for innovating new pathways for others. So the award reads, uh, Global, Global Trailblazer awarded for leadership excellence, Susan Goldberg, for innovative contributions to society and for creating pathways for others. Thank you so much. Thank you. And please, some opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lisa, that I am really honored to receive this award today. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to, to be here today. You know, I accept this award on behalf of women leaders and, and innovators, so many of whom never get any public recognition, including so many women who are trailblazing storytellers. Throughout my life, I've been really inspired by a lot of women in journalism. When I was a girl in the early 1970s, I saw publisher Catherine Graham of the Washington Post print the Pentagon Papers, and hold a corrupt U.S. president to account. I wouldn't know about the nearly incapacitating self-doubt that she harbored until I read her astonishing biography, 
called Personal History about 20 years later. In the 1980s, top female newspaper editors like Deborah Howell and Sandy Rowe were at the forefront of a generation of glass ceiling breakers, giving up-and-coming editors like me a realistic sense of what a woman in charge of a newsroom could actually act like and be like. Today, I'm bowled over by the bravery of journalists like photographer Lindsay Adario, who has literally put her life on the line to bear witness of the events unfolding in the Ukraine. I was so lucky to work with Lindsay and so many other barrier-breaking female photographers at National Geographic, and I'm so proud of what she's doing right now. What I've done in my career is very different from being on the front lines of a bloody battle, but I have been on the front lines of a different sort. And it's been a battle over what stories to tell and who should tell them. Over the years, in the course of that fight, I've learned to say yes to things that scare me. For much of my career, as Lisa mentioned, I've been the first woman in many of the jobs that I've held. Honestly, you'd think I was born in 1859 instead of 1959. But being the first also extends to my new job at GBH, where I am the first leader in 70 years. But at GBH, the public media company, I'm surrounded by trailblazing women who serve as executive producers and lead our organization. I believe in saying their names out loud, so let me do that. Rainey Aronson Rath at Frontline, Cameo George at American Experience, Julia Court at Nova, Marsha Bemko at Antiques Roadshow, Suzanne Simpson at Masterpiece, Pam Johnson at GBH News, Sita Pai at GBH Education, Liz Chang, who heads our World Channel, Yemisi Orlotondo Coates, who leads our DEIA efforts, and Ann Fudge, the chair of our Board of Trustees. And no list of powerhouse women in public media is complete without mentioning Paula Kerger, who heads up PBS, and Pat Harrison, who leads up the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. As you can see, there are so many women around me in positions of influence. I am heartened. But I also know that we'll be in a much better place in our society when having to report that women are in these positions isn't needed because it will just be the normal course of doing business. I mentioned at the outset that I've learned to say yes to things that scare me. There's power in that, the power to make change. In 2018, when I was the editor of National Geographic, I was scared when we did an entire issue about race because I knew that to be credible, I would have to explicitly talk with our readers about the magazine's previous racist and colonialist views and how they influenced our content for, for decades. So I did that. But I also explained how much we had changed and how much more change we needed to undergo. Not only was, not only was owning that history the right thing to do, it was the only way to move forward, to put a stake in the ground, and to make actual progress. When we did an issue about evolving views on gender, I put a nine-year-old transgender girl named Avery Jackson on the cover of National Geographic. I was scared. 10,000 people canceled their subscriptions to the magazine. But I can't tell you how many people have told me that that decision has made an enormous difference in their lives, allowing them to have conversations in their families that they never could before. Six years have gone by since that cover was published. I've spoken about it all over the world, and to this day, people still talk to me about the impact that it made. At the heart of all of these efforts, and many others, is my belief that to tell accurate stories, we need newsrooms that welcome women, people of color, people who are LGBTQ, and, who, and those who are diverse in other ways, reflecting multiple viewpoints, lived experiences, and a sense of storytelling as diverse as the world that we cover. I don't know of any media company that can say that we've completely solved this issue. National Geographic isn't there yet. Neither is GBH. But they are evolving, and changing this dynamic at every news organization is as important as anything that we can do. We also have to keep shining a light both on the lives of women who can inspire us and at the same time 
never stop reporting on the difficult, constrained lives of millions of women and girls all over the world whose inequality becomes invisibility until they, can be bar until they barely can be seen or heard at all. Changing that through our coverage, our choices, and our staffing is how we can help create a more equitable world. A few years ago at National Geographic, we did a book about women, capturing in words and photographs our story after the, over the last three centuries. As part of the book, I interviewed 25 of the most amazing women in the world, from former New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to scientist Jane Goodall to Oprah Winfrey. These women talked with me about equality, their personal journeys, and the changing opportunities for women. Alicia Garza, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, had this to say, and I'm quoting, my greatest strength is my ability to ignore it when I get no for an answer. When people say it cannot be done, there's something that goes off inside me and says, okay, watch me. I love that quote. Garza's statement captures the underappreciated trait of resilience that so many women share, including me. If I look at my life, resiliency is behind a lot of what I've been able to achieve. Being resilient means we keep trying. We don't give up, we show up, and we say yes to things that scare us. Now, I haven't led an Instagram perfect life or an easy life or a life where the way forward was always straight or clear. But I have led a resilient life, thanks in part to the guidance and legacy of the generation of women before me. I'm awestruck by the progress toward equality that they were able to scratch out for themselves and mapped for us to follow. But I also see great strength in the actions of younger women. I see a photograph taken by Lindsay Adario that I had in my office at National Geographic. I brought it with me to GBH. It hangs above my desk. It shows a Marine corporal named Gabrielle Green training for deployment. She's wearing a khaki green t-shirt and shorts, and she is walking up a steep ramp with a 200-pound man slung over her shoulder. The expression on her face is calm and very determined. She has a tattoo on one of her thighs, and you can read the writing. It says, the fire inside me burns brighter than the fire around me. It's no wonder that I keep that photo right in front of me, available for daily inspiration. For most of us, I think we can agree. We're not yet at the top of that ramp. There's still a long way to go. But we women are getting there, each in our own way. Some are as brave as Lindsay, our heroic photographer, or Gabrielle Green, a literal warrior. Others will forge a different path. What I know is that real change not, comes not only through big acts, but from a thousand smaller choices we make every day. And that's what I'll leave you with. It's a study in progress. It comes from doing the work, taking the risks, blazing the trail, passing the torch, and saying yes to things that scare you. Thank you so much, NYU, for this great honor. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for those remarks and for highlighting some of the work that you've done. And we're going to talk a little bit more. So we have a little bit of time here. We're going to be in conversation. And we also solicited questions from students in advance. So I have some of those questions from our graduate students and undergraduate students. Uh, we will, I'll, I'll leave a f about 10 minutes for us to have questions from the audience. But I do want to make sure I get to some of our student questions since they were so responsible in sending them in. So um, the first question really is, and you talked about this in your remarks, being the first, and I've been the first a few times, and so tell us a little bit about, you talked about some of the challenges that you faced. Tell us a little bit about that resiliency. How did you develop that resiliency um, and some of those challenges, and what have you learned along the way? You know, I thank you, Lisa. Um, I have such a conflicted view about being the first. I don't know if you feel the same. On one hand, you feel very honored that you're the first over and over and over again. On the other hand, it does point out to you how messed up it is that you're always the first because you shouldn't be the first and we will be in a better place when there aren't so many firsts because it'll just be standard that there are so many women or people of color 
or people at the intersection of all of these places who, who have these roles. So I do feel very conflicted about it. And people always point out that you're the first two, which is also a little weird. But anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but that said, I do think there's an important role that, that we can play as firsts, right? It's hard in that people look at you and judge you and you don't really want to make a lot of mistakes. You don't, I mean, you never do, of course, but you're, you're I think you're, you're held to a different standard, perhaps. The things that you do are held to a different degree of accountability than the mostly white men who came, came before. But that said, and it's a little bit, immodest to say this, but I do think that you become a role model in many ways for people who can take inspiration, if not by what you do, maybe just by who you are. And the fact that they could look at you and they might think you're not very smart, but they, they could legitimately say, hey, if she could do it, I could do it. And there is something really great about that. And I've always um, felt incredibly honored when people came up to me later and just said that, that you know, I set an example that gave them more confidence. I also think as a first, you really do need to reach out to other people and, you know, give a hand to people who are struggling, give encouragement to people who might not think they can do it, remind people who are filled with some of those doubts that, you know, they should give it a try. Um, and so I think those are, those are some of the things that I've learned about it. Terrific, thank you. And so my next question is really about, uh, and you mentioned this briefly in your remarks, but the power of storytelling and the importance of telling stories. And you've chosen to mobilize that power to create inclusion and equity, as you talked about. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the importance of storytelling and how, how you see that is so relevant. And not just because you work at National Geographic or GBH, but the importance of stories in terms of community, connection, and equity. I think all of us, whether we work in a media company or, or not, tell stories every day. And how we go about telling those stories really matters. If the story is only told from one point of view, you know, that is, in fact, one view of the world. That was sort of the situation that I felt I encountered when I first went to National Geographic in 2014. You know, it, it's a great organization that should be rightly proud of introducing many Americans to the world, the first time people had ever seen the world. But it was really only one world view, and that was a white male world view, both in the writers and the photographers. So we really set out very deliberately to change that through you know, the kinds of stories we told um, to appeal to different, a broader audience, but also who was telling those stories, who was being quoted in those stories, and, you know, whose viewpoint was reflected. And I think that's what all of us need to be aware of every day. That is the same journey we're on at GBH. I think it's the same journey that many media companies are on as we really have to, you know, do a little bit of self-reflection about why weren't women's stories, why weren't those stories told? Why haven't we heard of so many of these people, whether women or people of color, who have done incredible things? Why weren't those stories in the newspaper? And we need to set about setting that record straight. So I think there's all kinds of ways we can do that. But that's not just a responsibility of people in media, although we do have a megaphone. But I think each of us, in telling stories, and everybody's a storyteller now, right? Everybody's got a phone. Um, needs to own a little bit of that as, as a storyteller. You've been quite brave in some of the things that you've taken on. And uh, we heard about some of the cancellations of subscriptions. And so talk to us a little bit about, right, we, we have this, uh, one of the most influential books in my life in the 80s was entitled, But Some of Us Are Brave. And, and Melody Hobson has this about being brave, as I know you uh, know. And so talk to us a little bit about both what does it mean to be brave, to take a risk, to take a stance, and also talk to us about their real consequences. And so there's real feedback in the loop, as they say. So talk to us a little bit about navigating that as well. Well, it's always hard, right, to know which risk to take and which not to take. And I don't think that any of us want to, it's like people tell you, you you want to pick your battles. You should really pick the right battles. You don't want to fight every fight. 
because you've got to have allies. And if you're fighting every fight, you're probably going to be all by yourself somewhere. So, I, but I do think that for those of us who get into a position of influence, you know, if you're not going to do the thing that's the right thing, if you're not going to tell the story in the right way, maybe you shouldn't be in the business at some point. You've got to say to yourself. And so, you know, I, I can remember kind of taking a real deep breath before doing some of these things and just doing them, trying to do them in the smartest way I could, right? Letting people know we were doing this. You know, you don't want to do it in a stupid way. You don't want to, you know, get yourself into hot water when you don't need to. But continuing to push that envelope and to do so in a, in a smart way. So inviting people in. If you don't feel like you have the right voices at the table, if you're going to do a global issue about race and you look around and your staff is maybe not reflective of, uh, you know, of people um, that you need to reach, you've got to invite in more people to hear more voices to try to tell those stories in the right way. So I think it's OK to you know, decide you're going to do a brave thing but then do it in the smartest way. The other thing I would say about brave is sometimes it kind of sneaks up on you, right? <laughs> you don't set out necessarily to do a brave thing. I remember when we decided in 2018 to, to do this issue about race at National Geographic, and I knew from the outset that we would need, we National Geographic, would need to acknowledge the fact that, hey, we started in 1888 at the height of colonialism. It affected how we covered things. So I assigned that story initially to a freelancer. And then a little time went on, and I just was thinking, you know, no, no. This has to, this ownership needs to come from the editor. And so that's, you know, and so I did end up writing a, a letter to readers um, uh, all about our history, our present, and how different it was from our history, and what we plan to do going forward to make even more change. So it was sort of owning the story. And having a freelancer do that wasn't, wasn't going to own the story. But I didn't realize that at the outset. It just kind of came to me. And that's OK. Yes, and thanks for re revealing that because I think sometimes people think we're, we're perfect when we get there, right? And there's learning throughout the process and there's learning from others, which leads to my next question, which is really about collaboration and thinking about collaboration and how has that been relevant in your work? So talk to us a little bit about that and especially if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, transgenerational, multi-generational collaborations. You mentioned that in your talk a little bit, so talk to us about that as well. One of the great things about being a journalist now is that we are so much more collaborative generally as organizations, and I think this is true for just about everybody, than, than we were at the time I was coming up. At the time I was you know, a young journalist, everybody was seen as your competition, so you certainly didn't want to talk to anybody else. What I think we've increasingly realized is not only can we not solve all of these problems or tell all these stories by ourselves? But our competition isn't necessarily some other news organization. Our competition is the competition for people's time, the competition for people's headspace, the competition with mis- and disinformation. I mean, there's all kinds of competition. I don't necessarily think it's from another, another legitimate news, news provider. So you know, we, we can get together with them to tell the best kinds of stories, and sometimes we can collaborate with organizations very different from our organization. I remember at National Geographic, we collaborated with the Undefeated, which is you know a a store uh, an organization, a digital organization that tells the stories around the intersection of you know athletes and race, and it is it has basically got a black point of view is the whole the whole tenor of the organization. And we collaborated with them and some stories in the race issue because I felt like we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the right people at the table. But I do think also this generational um, issue is so interesting now. When I look at our staff at GBH, our largest staff is, is millennials, followed by Gen Xers, and then Gen Zs, who are our, our youngest, and then there's those of us who are baby boomers. So it's four different generations who look at work and storytelling in some pretty different ways. 
What we've tried to do, though, is not you know, go to war with each other over this, but find some common ground and look at where we can learn from each other. We've actually got an employee research, uh, resource group called um, Connection. And as, as one of my friends at work says, it's for the young and the young at heart. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, so what we're trying to do, even though you know, the way baby boomers might view work and the way millennials and, and Gen Zers view work might be really different, let's start with what we can learn from each other. Uh, one of the best things about being a journalist in the last 20 years has been watching not just older people tell younger people the way it is, which is how it always used to be, but younger people, in, in large part because of their technical understanding of audiences and how to transmit information on new platforms, telling older people how it is. So there became a two-way you know, sort of respect that went back and forth with different people's skills really getting highlighted, and that has been incredibly gratifying. So I think while there remain a lot of differences, you always got to start on with the common ground. Thank you for that. And so um, one of the things that you did in your remarks was um, uh, what another colleague of mine says, say their names, right? Say the names of the individuals who are important that you're working with, et cetera. So this leads me to my next question, which is really about mentorship. And I'm going to ask you this question both. Talk to us a little bit about mentorship that you've received. And then I know this about you. You are an incredible mentor and providing new pathways. So talk to us also a little bit about being a mentor and why that's so important to you. Um, you know, mentorship is interesting. There's active mentorship, and then there's the mentorship, you know, like I mentioned two women who were, who were newspaper editors in the 1980s. Um, and I didn't know either of them very well at the time. I got to know them o over the years, but they were just people that I could look to and say, hey, she can do it, right? And I did finally get to know them, and they were incredibly in encouraging to me. So I think that is one kind of mentorship. But I was, I was, got so much help along the way, frankly, from a, a lot of male mentors who were very invested in my career, who tried to help me along the way. I don't think that all mentors have to be exactly like you, look like you, act like you, or have the same background as you. In fact, there might be some really good reasons that they be from a completely different background because you can learn you can learn a lot. Um, but I, I felt very lucky and you know I was uh, never uh, really shy. Um, I asked for help, which is I do think one thing that is important. Um, it's incredibly important in the news and information business because you know you tend to be on a deadline and if you need help, you kind of need help right then. It's okay, really, to raise your hand. I've come to think that raising your hand and asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. Because it also shows people you know what you don't know. And there's, and there's something to that, because none of us have all the answers. I mean, in terms of being an, a mentor, I have tried to intervene at different points along the way in various people's careers, sometimes where I saw they were in trouble, or sometimes invest and try to get people who I thought were really talented to see a bigger picture, to see that they could do more than maybe the next job on the ladder. They could do a job that was 10 rungs up the ladder, that, that they were so amazing, and to try to let them know that you had that confidence in them. Um, and then also people have come to me along the way, and those have been great relationships that I've been able to develop with people. I remember at National Geographic, there was one young woman who was came into my office to tell to tell me she was leaving because she got a job at the New York Times and she sat down right next to me. And she looked at me and there was this big sigh and she said, do you ever have imposter syndrome? And so here was this incredibly talented young woman who just had like the best thing happen to her and she was like so bummed out and so scared. And I was just like, honey, fake it till you make it, right? You know, you can do this thing. And sometimes maybe it's just telling somebody that. But I, I, I wish that generally we all had much more confidence than, than we, I'm generalizing, um, seem to as women. 
Thank you so much. Um, and we know the statistics about who applies for jobs and what the criteria are and then their qualifications. And women sometimes um, uh, question themselves in those spaces. So thank you for sharing that with us. And you answered one of our questions that was actually going to be my next question from one of our grad students about that idea of imposter syndrome. So let's um, let's talk about this. And this is these are. Can some I say one more yes. thing about imposter yes. syndrome? I think men have secretly, quietly, maybe a lot of men have it too. They just don't talk about it. They just do it. Okay, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. And so this question is really about this idea of balance, right? And this is coming from our students and thinking about this idea of balancing your life. And so whatever that means for you. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because balance means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and then talk to us maybe even about how that balance has changed over the course of your career in life. Um, I have an unpopular answer to this question. <laughs> I don't have balance. I've never had balance. I gave it up a long, long time ago. Um, it, but I do think it can change. You know, it, that, that, that your needs, depending on you know, the rest of your life, balance can go up and down. You know, sometimes you can be all in. All you do is work. All, you know, you're practically pulling all-nighters, um, you know, doing everything you can, um, just, just working like crazy. And there might be some times when you might be trying to work a little less. But I, the one other thing I'll say that's not very popular is that I don't think men get asked about balance very much. And maybe they should. Um, but I don't really ever hear it. I don't think I've ever been in any forum of this sort where I haven't been asked about it. And I just admit, I have not had balance. I have been wildly career focused. I've had an incredibly supportive partner and that has made that possible. Thank you, and thank you for your candor. Um, my next question, again, from um, the students is, really thinking about this idea, and you just mentioned this, of dissemination of false information and the distrust of the media. What strategies have you, do you implement, but how do you sort of more generally think about um, that redirection in terms of misinformation and also the recorrection of the importance of media and journalism actually delivering accurate information? I, I think this is one of the huge <laughs> challenges um, for journalists and for media, uh, has been for the last number of years and obviously shows no signs of, of becoming less challenging. You know, one of the things that we do at GBH in Boston is to try to create transparency around the work that we do. So we produce Frontline, the uh, in investigative uh, series that you can see on television and on YouTube and other platforms. Rainey Aronson Roth is the executive producer and she's created what she calls the Transparency Project where in a so you can see the program, but you can also see all the outtakes of the interviews that she did to get that program. So where you, you might see an expert interviewed for a total of five minutes on the program, you can see, if you so want to, the whole two hour interview um, behind, behind the wall there, you know? And, and so you can, go and you can go and see that, and we let people in to see it, and I think things like that can help create trust because you know, often we are accused of cherry picking our facts, of not, you know, not really telling the full story. Well, people can see, and you know, you can do that by showing documents, by showing people source material, by, you know, letting people see how it was pretty much that you constructed your story. So I, I am really in favor of that. But I think this, you know, you can do all of these things. But what I think we mostly need to do are stories where people can understand that they are fair stories, that they feel like they, that we have credibility, that we, that these are stories that are well researched and, and make sense. And those are the ways to fight it. I am very nervous about, you know, AI in, in some ways, about imitate, the, its ability to imitate, you know, real stories. I am very nervous about the active, acts of dishonesty that are sometimes um, sometimes present in stories. But I think the way to fight back is just to do credible, good journalism and then show people and tell people how you did it. A 
Okay, I'm going to turn to the audience after this question, and so uh, if you have a question, please get ready. Um, and so this is, um, this is again, these are all questions from, from students, but this uh, question is, you know, what's your hope for um, emerging leaders, and what's, it, what's some advice you would give to 20-year-old Susan Goldberg? 20-year-old Susan Goldberg was in so much of a hurry, she wouldn't have listened to any advice anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. I maybe slow down would not have been bad advice. Um, um, but um, I think it would be to quit being so scared, right? To quit worrying so much about everything. I used to try to plot out exactly, you know, this is how my life is going to go, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be this reporter, and then I'm going to be an assistant city editor, and then I'm going to become the city editor, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. And it kind of did work out that way, but there were lots of detours. And then me ending up at a public media company at the age of 63 after, you know, a 42-year career spent not in public media, big giant surprise. So I, I would tell myself not to, not to be such a fanatic planner and worrier, and that's what I think I would tell myself. Terrific. Questions from the audience? You know, I can ask questions all day. Some of you know me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophie Verone. I'm an employee um, in the communications um, area at NYU. Um, I was interested in coming to this talk because uh, up until a few months ago, I was a journalist at a cable news enterprise in a very difficult, um, frankly, cutthroat, scary, deeply competitive environment, and that's why I left. And so when you talk about imposter syndrome, it resonates to me because I'm experiencing that as I transition to a completely new um, career and way of living at NYU, and I've achieved balance and, and happiness that I've uh, looked for. So my question to you is generally, Basically, how do you see a career path as a journalist? You talked about it a little bit. Do you see um, it possible to take breaks? And um, and uh, I don't know. I think that's and and what do you? I guess what are what is your advice for um, what skills journalists can employ in careers outside of journalism? Oh, I actually think that if you're a journalist meaning you're a curious person who's got the ability to convey, to synthesize and convey information on a variety of platforms, whether that's written or video or on Snapchat or wherever. Um, you know, do, do TikTok videos. I mean, you can do good journalism on TikTok too. Um, it's an incredible skill that can be used. I mean, it's an umbrella, it's, it's a, it's a, most people can't communicate. Let's, let's put it that way. All right, I worked with a lot of scientists at National Geographic. They weren't very good at telling their own story, by and large. A few of them were, but most of them really weren't. And so if you've got that ability to translate and to package things in a way that makes them make sense and tells a, a narrative on whatever platform it is, that's a great skill. You could go, you could work in banking or law or politics or, because everybody, Every organization, every company has a story it's trying to tell. And so there's all kinds of ways your skills can be used. I think those journalistic skills are incredibly handy. And the other thing, I hope you have good writing skills. Most people can't write hardly at all. How do you build your confidence? How did you and how do you stay confident? Do people challenge you? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, it's a real life, right? Everybody, you know, everybody has, has their challenges. Um, I don't always feel confident. I mean, who does, right? No, none of us do. But I, I think that over time, as I've had more and more experiences, you can kind of start drawing, you can start drawing on those experiences, right? It's like what you were saying. If, if, you, if you know that you're a good writer or translator of stories, you can be confident in that, and then you can be confident about the next thing and the next thing. And all of us have things in our lives that we don't know much about. I have this new job. I'm on the job for 95 days. I'm learning a lot every single day. Um, and there's a part of the job, we, ha we have kind of a music business 
Nothing in my career has prepared me for having anything to do with the music business. But what I am confident about is one, I'll learn more, and two, I'm really confident in the abilities of the people who know a lot about that to do a great job. So, I mean, I don't think you have to be wildly confident about every single thing you do. You can draw on the strengths of the team that you surround yourself with, and I think that's incredibly important. That will help you make the best decisions that you can. Terrific. Other questions? Are you texting me? Okay, we have a question right here. Hi, um, did you ever get a job um, just because the employer um, wanted to find a, a woman candidate first um, before looking for men? Um, I don't know for sure. I wouldn't be shocked by that. Um, and that's okay. I mean, you got the job, and then you run with it, right? So it seems to me it's good to get the job if it's the job that you want, you know, as long as you go about it honorably and honestly. Um, and, you know, people have all kinds of reasons for, for hiring people. You know, sometimes it's to fill in a gap where they think they're not strong or, or you might have some skill. Uh, or maybe it is because you're a woman and they feel like, you know, that perspective is absent uh, on the team. Whatever, right? But uh, to me, you get the job and then you go do a great job. Thank you for that. Because keeping the job is yeah. different than getting the job, yeah. right? Here, right here. Yeah, for sure. Hi, my name is Emily Balchettis. I'm a professor in the psychology department. And some of the research that, um, that my research team and I have done has looked at women in leadership. And um, what we found is that you know, we and the media have been talking about women's underrepresentation in leadership for a really long time. And people get used to that story. They habituate to that specific kind of narrative. And sometimes they tune out. I'm a psychologist, so motivationally their, their mindset is that I've heard this story, this seems like an insurmountable problem, what could we possibly do about it, I don't want to hear this story again. So, we, so what we have found in our research is, well, if you tell that same story but from a different perspective, like in some cases men's overrepresentation in this leadership space, or rather than the underrepresentation of people of color, the overrepresentation of white people, for instance, and you tell the same story with the same true facts but from a different perspective, then it has a different effect. Psychologically, people start saying like, oh, wait a minute, that's not fair, that's an injustice, and they feel angry. And it's a, a different, from our perspective, a different way of telling that story that produces a different emotional and motivational response, which we find in our research, leads them to engage in collective action, like writing letters to their senator to advocate for bills that are being debated in the House right now to support women's empowerment, for instance. Um, so I wonder what your take on that is, on, on that perspective of how telling that story from a different perspective can shake things up. But then also the consequence, which is that we're finding it makes people angry at the social injustice. Not anger at the writer, although that happens too, but anger at the injustice. But then the issue is, do we want to be writing stories that just create more anger in the world? And is an anger part of the bigger problem of what we're dealing with other aspects of in society? So that's my sort of two-part question. Well, I think you raise a couple of important points. One, I, th I think it is true what you say, that when you tell stories about whatever it is in the same way over and over and over, people do glaze over. This has nothing to do with women, but I think you see this a lot in how the media tells stories about the climate crisis, right? You know, it's, it, it, is, it is so negative, it is so the world, often those stories are, the world is ending, you know, things are terrible, the glaciers are melting, the seas are rising, everything is bad. And while all that is true, there's a way to tell that story while also to focus on the incredible very positive work that is going on to try to mitigate that, right? The incredible breakthroughs that are going on without glossing over the problems. I think some of the same thing is true when we talk about female representation because what's odd is, you know, for a long time there was growth, 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 and then a stall, right? It's still incredibly low in a lot of fields, and it is frustrating, and why? Why does it stay that way? Another way to tell the story is not just talk perhaps about male overrepresentation, 
Although I always do like the stories where they say sometimes on a Senate, Senate committee, there's more men on this committee named Mike than you know any you know any women in the whole Congress, right? Um, uh, but so that that's one way to do it. But the other way to do it is to actually look at the achievement and accomplishments of women who are succeeding in those fields, and to really shine a light on all of that on the best part of it, so that forward, so that inspiration can be can be um, emulated. In terms of anger, look, I I think that is not that's not what I think at all. It's I think we have to tell true stories. And true stories and about distressing things can make people angry. And there hopefully that anger is channeled in a in a positive way for positive change. But there are going to be some number of people who are just angry. And I don't you're the psychology professor, not me. I don't know what to do with that exactly, but I don't think that should prevent us from telling those important stories. We have one time for one last question. That goes to you. So I understand you recently went through a transition into this new role, and we here at NYU are undergoing a big leadership transition right now as well. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the leadership practices you really lean on in moments of transition. Oh. Um, I hadn't thought about them as practices. <laughs> um, um, you know, mostly just trying to keep my head above water. I, I think is is a fair way to look at it. Really, what I'm trying to do is, I, I am in a new city, in a new role, and in a job that is quite complex, has a lot of constituencies. So what I'm trying to do is not go in and say, oh, this, 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 let's change that immediately. Not at all. It's quite the opposite. I'm really trying to go in and learn from all of my colleagues. I mentioned we have a music business I know nothing about. Great, but we've got, but it's a really complex organization. So I think the most important thing that I can do now as a new leader is to go in there and try to understand, to meet people, to understand the way things have happened, to understand the challenges of the business, but at the same time, kind of keep a little mental list saying, well, why, why do we do it that way? Or have we ever thought about doing it these other ways. And there's plenty of time, actually, to ask those questions. But the first thing I think I can do is to understand, to listen, and to get to know people. That, to me, is like job one for a while. Thank you. Thank you. And as we come to a close, I have one last question. Uh, this is International Women's Day, and the theme is Embrace Equity. So tell us uh, some final words as you think about this idea as we move forward to embrace equity. I like the word equity. And I don't think that we think about it as much. We talk about equality. And equity is a bit different, right? Equity is about understanding that not everybody is going to come from the same place. So I once heard somebody describe it that if there were a tall fence and everybody wanted to see over the fence and you gave everybody a two-foot stool, well, some of the people would be able to see over the fence, the taller people. But the shorter people still might not be able to see over the fence. And so I really like that as a description because it's a great reminder that we're not all coming from the same place. And we all need different tools to succeed. We all need a helping hand. But some of us need, need that helping hand in different ways. And that's what all of us, whether, whether we're a boss or a colleague or a friend or a relative, what we all can do. In our, in our own community, whether in work or in our personal lives, which is to, to see the uneven playing field and do everything we can uh, to try to make it more even. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. We are ecstatic to present you again with this award. Thank you for being with us today. I'd like to also thank everyone again. Thank you for everyone who's joined us online via Zoom and the live stream. Also, thank you to my entire team again. Thank you to our co-sponsors. Thank you to the closed captioners. Thank you to our interpreter who's been doing a terrific job. And thank you to you all for coming today. Let's give another round of applause to Susan Goldberg. <laughs>